Good morning, and thank you so much for inviting me today to talk about some of the data we collect in the surveillance program at the National Cancer Institute. Um, I think that I'm going to give the presentation today, and Angela, who is in the back and maybe can raise her hand so people see who she is, is also around to answer questions, you know, during the presentation and at the breaks. Okay, um, next slide. <clears throat> So I wanted to start by giving a little bit of background about what surveillance research is and the types of data that we collect. The surveillance program's mission is to provide a quantitative portrait of cancer and its determinants by collecting and managing data through cancer registries. And um, the cancer registry that we manage is called the Surveillance Epidemiology and End Results, or SEER program. We also fund special studies and data linkages Another mission is to develop statistical models and methods designed to improve national estimates of cancer burden. And of course, we um, focus on reporting and interpreting the data that we collect. The SEER program, as we call it, is a US population-based cancer registry system. Um, it collects high quality data on cancer incidence and survival. It was established in response to the National Cancer Act in 1971 and it began collecting data in January of 1973. So currently we have 17 SEER sites and they're shaded on the map in either blue or green. So each state in the U.S. has a cancer registry. Some are funded by NCI, some are funded by CDC, and some are funded by both. But the focus of this presentation is going to be cancer collected by the SEER registries. And the important thing to note is that in the areas shaded on the map, we collect information on all cancers diagnosed in those geographically defined areas. Um, this slide shows the coverage of the SEER areas. Overall, it covers 26% of the U.S. population. It covers about 23% of whites and blacks in the U.S., slightly more for um, American Indians and Alaska Natives and Hawaiian and Pacific Islanders, and that's because of how the registries were initially identified to make sure we had coverage on those populations. This compares the areas in SEER with the areas in the U.S. So they're similar in terms of measures of poverty and education. The SEER areas uh, tend to be a little bit more urban than the U.S. in general and it has a higher percent of foreign-born individuals. So before I start showing data from the registry, <clears throat> I wanted to go over briefly some of the measures that we commonly report. So the most common is incidence, and that represents the number of cases diagnosed in a year per 100,000 people in the population. So if, just for example, if the incidence rate was five, that means over the course of a year, for every 100,000 people in the population, you would identify five cancer cases. We typically report age-adjusted incidence, and the reason that we adjust for age is if we're comparing incidence between populations that have different age distributions, we want to make sure that we're comparing risk and not reflecting a different age groups. Um, we report five-year survival, and this is the probability of surviving cancer in the absence of other causes of mortality. Prevalence is the number of people alive at a particular time in the United States that have had a previous diagnosis of cancer. And we also report lifetime risk. Um, this is two separate measures. One is the probability that a person would develop cancer over the course of their lifetime. And the other one is the probability that a person would die of cancer over the course of their lifetime. So to give some context, I wanted to show where prostate cancer falls in relation to other cancers. So this is a list of incidence rates for the top 15 cancers that we collect information on, and prostate is the, the number one. And I wanted to point out also that to compare, this is a, a slide that looks at cancer burden, and so to compare for different cancer sites, these are incidence rates over the whole population. As I go on further, I'm going to show incidence rates for men only, and then you'll see the numbers approximately double. The next slide. Um, these are the top 15 uh, sites for mortality in the U.S. And here you can see that prostate moves to fifth behind lung, colorectal, breast, and pancreas. But again, um, because this is a cancer burden measure, it's of the whole 
population, men and women. If you looked at only mortality rates in men, it would be second, only behind lung cancer. These are the most current estimates of incidence and mortality for prostate cancer. Um, for men, for black men, it is 260, incidence is 260 cases per 100,000 men in the population. For whites, it's 153 per 100,000. So incidence for black men is about 70% higher than it is for white men. Mortality is 52 per 100,000 for black men and 22 per 100,000 for white men. So mortality is um, just over twice as high for black men as it is for white men. We often look at incidence rates by age when screening um, is, an, is a, a factor for, for that site. And we look at it cut off by 65 because that's the age where people have access to health care through Medicare. But the relationship is the same for less than 65 and older 65. This shows long-term trends by race. Um, starting in 1992, we were able to produce incidence rates for um, <coughs> additional race and ethnicities due to uh, getting the proper population from the Census Bureau. So that's why those lines started in 1994. But overall, you can see that there was a sharp increase <coughs> with the introdu introduction of PSA, and that was followed by a decrease. The decrease was more sharp in whites than it was in blacks. Blacks experienced a smaller decrease and then a, a continued decline at, at a lower rate. Over the last 10 years, all of these um, groups have experienced a statistically significant decline in incidence rates. Um, this shows mortality. And again, before the early 90s, mortality was fairly flat in um, whites, but it was increasing in blacks. And after that point, there's been a statistically significant decline in all groups. I wanted to plot this again on one graph with incidence and mortality down the same graph. So you can see that in this site, there is a very large distance between incidence and mortality. Um, other sites like lung cancer, incidence and mortality are almost at the same level. But the reason there's such a big difference between incidence and mortality is survival for prostate cancer is really very good. Next slide. This gives survival by stage. So um, for prostate cancer, most men are diagnosed in early stage, with only 4% diagnosed in late stage or after uh, the, the cancer has metastasized. So among early stage, survival is extremely good, about 97% at five years. For late stage disease, it's, it's only um, around 31%. Blacks do have a higher rate of late stage disease at diagnosis than whites with 6% as opposed to 4. This slide shows the risk of developing cancer and the risk of dying of cancer. So the risk of developing cancer over the course of a lifetime um, for whites is 1 in 6, for blacks it's 1 in 5, for Asians 1 in 9 and Hispanics 1 in 7. And that means that um, for blacks, one man in five will develop prostate cancer before, over the course of their lifetime. The risk of dying of prostate cancer is much smaller. One in 38 for whites, one in 22 for blacks, <coughs> one in 44 for Asians, <coughs> and one in 32 for Hispanics. It's estimated in 2011 that there will be um, Two, 200, over 240,000 new cases of prostate cancer diagnosed, and over 35,000 of those would be in black men, representing about 14.5% of new cases. Um, it's also estimated that there'll be over 33,000 deaths from prostate cancer, and 5,300 will be in black men, representing about 15.8% of deaths. Uh, overall, uh, black men represent about 12.5% of the male population in the U.S. So this slide looks at pre um, prevalence, which is a measure of cancer survivors. So it's estimated that in 2008, there's 
just under 12 million cancer survivors alive in the United States. Most cancer survivors, or the majority of them, are from um, breast cancer or prostate cancer. And the reason for that is they're very common cancers and they have very good survival. I mean, if you look at lung cancer, which is also very common but has poor survival, they only represent 3% of survivors in the U.S. So prostate cancer is a large portion of this pie, both because it's, it's common and because of the survival is very high. It's estimated that 2 million, over 2,300,000 men are alive in 2008 had a previous diagnosis of prostate cancer. For whites, it's just under 1 million, and for blacks, it's 284, over 284,000. Another way to look at the same type of data is to look at the percent of men alive at different ages who have a previous diagnosis of prostate cancer. So if you looked at men 65 to 74, um, for whites, 8% of them would have had a previous diagnosis of prostate cancer and 13% for blacks. By the time you get to men 85 and above, 16% of whites would have had a previous diagnosis of prostate cancer and 21% of blacks. So an answer, a question that people are very interested in is are the disparities increasing or decreasing? And the answer to that depends on the measure of disparity that you're using. Some factors that you might want to consider when you're assessing whether disparities are increasing or decreasing are do you really want to compare two groups or are you looking for a summary measure that looks at differences across multiple groups? And if you're comparing two groups, who should be the reference group? Should it be the largest group? which um, are whites in the U.S., or should it be the group that has the best outcomes? Should the comparison be relative or absolute? Um, should it be weighted by the number of individuals affected in each group, and are the, are the events favorable or adverse? So next slide. So there was recently a publication saying that disparities have been increasing in sites related to screening. And this is a graph of the relative disparity for prostate cancer over time. And so the relative means that it's the rates, mortality rates for black men divided by the mortality rates for white men. And you can see that it's increasing. However, oh, next slide. If you had looked at an absolute difference and just subtracted the rates, you would have gotten a different picture where it looks like the disparities or inequalities are going down. So if you looked at the difference, you would think, you would, might conclude that um, there's been a 28% decrease in disparities. But if you were looking at a relative measure, you might conclude that there's been a 10% increase in disparities. Next slide. So it's, sometimes it's hard to make a conclusion for this question. And I just wanted to um, point out that there's really no theory that tells us that inequalities is relative or absolute. And it's not where those are two measures of the same things. They're really different concepts. And you might not need one measure to really describe inequalities or health disparities. You may want to look at a suite of measures to get that more complete picture. Next slide. So at NCI, um, we have developed uh, something we call a health disparities calculator, or HDCalc. And this is what's specifically designed to look at population level data and to generate multiple summary measures to evaluate and monitor health disparities. And I wanted to include information on where you could find out more information about this tool and um, how it's been used and even some training if people are interested. Next slide. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the role of screening as well. The cancer registries do not collect information on screening when um, for their cases, but we have information on uh, screening rates through national surveys that are, that are population-based and representative of the U.S. So here are some results from the 2005 survey that asks men 50 and older if they've um, received a PSA test within the past year. And the first couple blocks that are in green show rates of recent PSA screening by race, and they're in the low 40s. They don't really look like they vary that much by race. If you look at it by education, which are the next four bars, you do see that lower education has lower screening rates um, 
with 35% of people reporting a recent PSA screening in less than a high school education, all the way up to 44 for college graduates. And the final three bars show the difference by insurance. And um, the highest rates are, of course, in people who have private or medical insurance, and uninsured have the lowest rates of 33% screening in the, in the previous year. Um, NCI supports a consortium of modelers called CISNET, which stands for Cancer Intervention and Surveillance Modeling Network. And one of the CISNET groups are um, focused on prostate cancer. And they model the impact of cancer control interventions, such as screening, treatment, primary prevention, on current and future cancer trends in the U.S. population. So all their modeling is population-based. And the CISNET group um, prostate cancer models have been used to evaluate the benefits and harms of PSA screening. So mortality for prostate cancer, as we saw earlier, has been decreasing, and it's actually decreased 40% overall from 94 to 2007, going from 38.5 to 23.5 deaths per 100,000. And the two CISNET models were used to project what prostate cancer mortality would look like with PSA screening as seen in the general population and without PSA screening. And they concluded that between 45 and 70 percent of the mortality decline observed in the 1990s could have been attributed to the stage shift induced by screening. Next slide. Um, of course, there's trials, clinical trials, which is the, the highest level of evidence for PSA screening that have been looking at mortality outcomes. One in the U.S., which is the prostate, lung, colorectal, and ovarian, or PLCO trial, reported no benefit, no mortality benefit for PSA screening. At the same time, a European trial reported a small but statistically significant mortality benefit. The CISNET groups plan to inform this debate around the benefits of PSA um, screening by modeling these two trials to try to understand how much of the difference in results of these two trials can be attributed to different trial designs or different protocols for the follow-up um, PSA screening results. <coughs> and they also plan to model whether the benefits seen in the trial look like they're consistent with what we're seeing in the um, population observational data from the cancer registries. And they've also looked at overdiagnosis. <clears throat> this picture of an iceberg has, has been used a lot with prostate cancer to get at the idea that a lot of the cases are maybe sort of under the, under, underwater in that they're not showing up clinically and that by introducing screening you're bringing up some of these cases that would have not been diagnosed to the surface. So we define overdiagnosis as cancers identified through screening that would not otherwise have been detected over a person's lifetime. Um, so men would have died with their cancer, but it would have never been detected or caused them any problems. Before PSA screening, 9% of men were diagnosed with prostate cancer in their lifetime, currently at 16%. And more aggressive screening policies increase the mortality benefits but at the same time, it increased the risk of overdiagnosis. So CISNET models have been used to estimate the amount of overdiagnosis, and they have concluded a range between 23 and 42 percent of screen-detected cases may be overdiagnosed in the United States. I think that, so that sort of summarizes some of the statistics that we collect related to prostate cancer. I wanted to point out um, that the NCI is having a state of the science conference in December and their website is now available to look at the role of active surveillance um, in the management of low-risk prostate cancer cases. And I, and I also wanted to give some reports, websites, and articles that we produce every year that um, is a resource to find statistics like the ones I've reported here from the cancer registries. And one site of particular interest, I think, might be the state cancer profile site, because that not only gives statistics at the national level, like I've done here, but it also gives statistics at the state and county level. And all these reports and websites can be reached through the SEER uh, 
the SEER website, there's links to all of them. So that's a good starting point to get to the other reports. Yes, so I also wanted to thank all the people that supplied me with data and modeling results for this presentation. And, um, and leave up these websites in case people would like to follow up on any of those presented.